and gives accessible minima in neural networks. Okay. Okay, just a little. Sì, va bene, grazie. Okay, so good morning. Um, <clears throat> the, the approach I would like to discuss is more related to optimization and you know, how neural network uh, work starting from, uh, say, a, a bottom-up approach. So somehow I'm revisiting the, what we knew already many years ago and uh, uh, it always comes to my mind uh, as a, a comment by Bert Kapp and says it's always the same stuff. He doesn't use the word stuff, but uh, in the, no, it's not. I think it is not always the same stuff. I think there's something new going on. So from very, uh, by studying the, the structural elements of, uh, say, modern models of, of neural network, I hope I can convey uh, this, uh, this view. Okay, so the idea in general is, uh, to analyze uh, the, 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 the space of uh, minima in the loss function of, of neural network and see how this depends on the choice of, uh, of the loss function, the, the activation function, the architecture, and, and also on the learning dynamics. And uh, the object, what my conjecture is that there exists rare accessible minima uh, which through this kind of modification become dominant and have good generalization properties. That's it. I'm not talking about the influence of the data or anything. It's a very basic uh, thing. So the kind of models we will be talking about are uh, a neural network of, of this type. I don't, so the output is a composite function of all the layers. Here you have nonlinear activation functions. And we want to learn a set of patterns so x is the input and y is the, uh, is the output. Okay, and uh, this training is performed by minimizing a loss function. Uh, so in the pure model, this loss function should be the number of errors. You know, after all, what we want to do is we have a set of examples and we want to minimize the number of errors we make on the examples and that's it. And then check how things behave on, on uh, um, we have no priors on the data, so this is what we should do. However, uh, we don't actually minimize the number of errors because this function cannot, uh, you cannot ru run a gradient here. This, uh, the derivative is not, not analytic. So uh, what in practice we do is, is to minimize something like the mean square error. So the difference between the desired uh, output activation and the actual, actual, uh, actual output activation or something else, which is the cross entropy, which more or less is like assuming that the, um, the variables which are deterministic are actually interpreted as probabilities, okay? And so it's a soft version. It's an arbitrary choice, but uh, so this function works. And, uh, and, the, and the key point is that uh, on this kind of function, you can run a stochastic gradient or gradient or whatever uh, algorithm you want. And uh, what is most used in practice is the cross-entropy function. Why is it so? Because it works better. This is the answer which is given uh, by the people that are using it. So, um, so what is the general situation? Well, the general situation, let me just go to, the, to this point here, is that we normally use uh, algorithms that uh, have been thought, have been designed for convex problems, and we use it for a non-convex, highly non-convex uh, task. So this is the situation, and it works. And it works very well. So we need to understand the, this point, I think. Uh, <clears throat> okay, first of all, uh, these are the real deep networks. Imagine that each block is some kind of a huge neural network. So these are the objects we would like to understand. And of course, we cannot do anything analytically on these kind of models. And so uh, we just restrict to the building blocks uh, and ask ourselves, if the building blocks are, you know, special in some sense. This is, and because after all, if you have such a huge object and you want to optimize this, you better have something which is really efficient at the basic level, otherwise you would, you know, kind of, uh, it would be very, very difficult to optimize anything here. So the, 
this kind of complicated object must be composed of some very efficient devices in, from the point of view of, of optimization. So these are, in fact, the networks that we can look at. I mean, we are really back in the 90s from this perspective. So we can study simple multilayer network with one hidden layer, or we can study with continuous or discrete weights. And, the, and these are the kind of uh, things we're going to study. And also, we are going to study random patterns, so without structure. I would like to, to be able to study the kind of patterns that, that Mark was describing with, with some uh, superposition of features and so on. But as you know, this is an insurmountable problem from a technical point of view because of correlation. So let's stick to, to just random uncorrelated patterns. And what I want to argue is that, so somehow what we're going to study are more properties of the device rather than properties of the data, OK? Because the random patterns are some, are hard, we know they are hard to learn, uh, but they don't have a particular correlation to exploit. OK. So the approach we will take, and uh, it's just as, as you would expect, is just to construct a, a, a Boltzmann weight, which is given by e to the minus beta, the loss function we want to analyze. And uh, well, z is the, is the partition function. And um, so in the space of all the weights, so the couplings on the edges of, uh, of our neural network, we want to study you know, this kind of measure. And we, are going, we, will be, we will be interested in the limit of large beta, which will uh, lead to uh, a distribution which is uh, focused on the minima of the loss function. OK, so this, this, me this measure is going to concentrate on the minima. And so it's going to tell us a lot about the space of solution, the space of minima of this learning problem. And we're going to use uh, techniques from, from Spingler's theory. So, uh, as I said, in the limit beta going to infinity, we are back to the very old and famous Gardner volume calculation because, uh, I mean, uh, here we are only selecting the W such that all the patterns are correctly satisf satisfied. Otherwise, the weight would be zero. So we are cutting the volume, the, the, the space, in the, the W space into pieces, and we are looking to the volume, uh, what remains, in the volume, the, in the accessible volume of the Ws, what remains after we have stored all the patterns. And if something is non-clear for the non, uh, for the physicists who are not old enough, or uh, uh, for the non-physicists, just just ask because I don't, I have to skip the details for a reason of time. And what we find, what has been found, for instance, for an architecture like this, in which you fix these weights and uh, you learn only through the first layer, but already it's a highly non-convex device, is something like this, is that P is the number of path train, random training patterns, and uh, N is the size of the input. In limit of large N and large P, where the ratio is, is constant, what you find is a scenario like this, is that for slow, small alpha, and namely when you have few uh, let's say, relatively few patterns with respect to the number of degrees of freedom you have, the space of solution is somehow connected. Whereas uh, above a certain threshold, you know, you start the, 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 the symmetry breaks somehow, and, you, and the space of uh, uh, the weight space has to be disconnected. And, you know, also local minimum critical points appear in this region, so learning becomes difficult. So if you run a, a plain stochastic gradient descent on this machine, you easily find solution here, but here you get, get into troubles, okay? Now, um, so is this really what, what uh, is this enough to understand how neural network behave? Because this would be one of the building blocks of this huge network. So, what I think is that, no, this is absolutely not enough. And also, I think that this was a kind of a misleading view we had in the 90s. So you know, we somehow thought that, I mean, at least I thought that somehow algorithm would have exploited the, the structure of, of these states and you know, would have converged somewhere and so on and so forth. And uh, this is not the case. And not because the, the theory was not incorrect, but there are other things happening in this network that are relevant for algorithms, which, as we all know, do not agree to detail balance, so need not to end up in the dominant states of the Gibbs measure. So we have been kind of 
a bit biased towards the study of equilibrium statistical physics for this uh, kind of problems, whereas you should have studied the non-equilibrium aspects. And this is what we've been doing recently. So let's start from, you know, let's revisit a few results from the 90s and see that there's something wrong going on here. So it, the, the model of the neuron that also Tiju was talking about is, you know, the mccullough pitts new uh, model, which is, you know, just, you know, uh, threshold, a, a sum of all the input, weighted sum of the inputs, and then you have this step function to decide the output, okay? So this was the old model, but, you know, in the last years, we, we went from this model to a model in which the activation fun function is, a, is a, tan a hyperbolic tangent and a sigmoid, and now people are using the ReLU function. Is there any qualitative difference between this, this model? I know this is a very picky kind of question, but let's look at it. And uh, so if you now study the, 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 the Gardner problem with ReLU functions, what you find, so you, take, uh, so you take a model like this. So again, you have uh, a, a one, one hidden layer. Here you have the Ws, and here you have random signs. So some plus and some minus is because the ReLU function is either zero or positive, so in order to have a balanced output, you have to have some of these fixed weights in the last layer to be minus and some other to be plus. And you study this object using statistical physics method. What you find, let me be quick, is this, this result that while if you use a sine function, you have a capacity that diverges as the square root of log of k of the number of hidden units, so the more uh, you in increase the size, uh, the number of hidden units, uh, the, the, the better you can uh, you know, perform in terms of capacity, so the number of patterns you can actually learn. Whereas if you use ReLU functions, this critical capacity remains finite independently on k. So, uh, I mean, nothing, this is actually also true for the sigmoid. So, uh, this is kind of a strange result because in the at least I, in the 90s, I would have been happy about this, this result because, oh, well, look, we have a great capacity. But then it turns out that we're using a device with a small capacity. So, so how is it that we are, you know, we, the neural network have, have evolved to choose this kind of devices rather than this kind of devices? By the way, this is suggesting that it's not very particularly effective to go wide uh, because you don't gain in doing that. Um, well, the reason is for, for sure that we can run gradient descent on, 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 on this kind of function, whereas we cannot run it here. So that's a very practical uh, observation. But also, when you start to have ReLU function, the notion of hyperplane is going to be uh, weakened because the output is a, a continuous variable that has to be summed. So everything becomes a bit more uh, complicated. And also, there are other things that I will clarify in, in later. Okay, this is just a starting point. So there's something strange going on already at this level. So I have to, I know I've been saying this many, many times, I'm sorry, but I have to go back to the binary perceptron for a moment because let, let me remind you that my plan is, you know, uh, analyze the, uh, what we have overlooked uh, uh, in the weight space of uh, a neural network and then see how the modification that have been implemented in the last decade, you know, exploited this fact. And so let me go back to the simplest model of, of neural network, which displays a, a, a non-convex landscape, a non-convex behavior. And I mean, the simplest one is probably the binary perceptron that has been studied since the 80s, and, you know, it's a beautiful model. And in here, uh, um, instead of talking about the volume of... Uh, uh, in the weight space, we have to talk about the entropy because uh, the, the weights are binary, so everything is simplified. And so what we are interested in, you know, is to understand uh, which is the entropy of, of solutions, okay? So that, and that's the way you, you characterize the capacity. And, of course, the, the space of, of couplings is just an hypercube in uh, n dimension. Okay, so this, is, uh, the, this was model was was sold by Mark uh, and Werner Crown in 89 with a beautiful paper. And, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of work on this, uh, on this topic and uh, some, there's an interesting, I mean, this very inspiring paper by uh, Wang and Kabashima in which they analyze the minimum distance between solutions 
in this problem. And also there is a rigorous result by Ding and, and Sun. Uh, it's not at this workshop, sorry, it's a previous workshop. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and, and um, in which they prove a, a lower bound for this quantity, uh, which is, uh, so it's a, a beautiful uh, technique. But so the scenario for this kind of model is that fine, your, the capacity is 0.83, so you can store with n synapses 0.83 n uh, random patterns, and uh, the, the landscape is a golf course with, uh, you know, uh, typical distance the, with the, the distance between typical solution, which is always of order n for any value of alpha. So this is the. Now, you agree with me that with such a landscape, you expect to not be able to do any learning in this kind of device, because this is very similar, this landscape is very similar to an error correcting code, and we know that from random initial condition, finding a, you know, a, a code word is a, is a hard problem, a cryptographic system based on, on this. So, I mean, also from spin glass theory, there are many, many arguments, so uh, clearly there's something strange happening here, because we, we would expect learning to be impossible. But in fact, so this is the, so the, so the, the results of the theory is that typical minima are isolated, okay? And then there's a glassy landscape. There is even a freezing transition like in the uh, random energy model for sufficiently large values of alpha. And yet, uh, you know, algorithm works, and, but what they find is something that is, is not belonging to this uh, scenario. So in order to, so, so we found some numerical evidence at the beginning in which we could, we could detect the fact that the kind of solution that uh, algorithm finds are actually solutions that are not of this type. They are not point-like, but they are kind of wide uh, regions. So they find solutions which are surrounded by an exponential number of other solutions on a region of diameter, which is order n. So this, of course, this is you know, a subdominant contribution to the Gibbs measure, so you cannot really detect this using standard replica techniques, so you have to do something else. And so what we did is um, to uh, introduce what we call the, the local entropy measure. It's just, instead of optimizing just the, just instead of considering the energy function uh, as a number of errors, we look for a region in the weight space that are dense in solution. So what we want to maximize is the so-called local entropy, namely the log of the number of solutions contained in, a re in hyperspheres of re radius d. So we are just, in this golf course, we are looking for a lake, okay? So this is a, a complicated function in principle to compute, but as we will see, this, uh, this can actually be done, okay? So, if you, instead of just trying to minimize the error, try to min maximize the number of uh, solution within a certain region, even though this region is subdominant, you can actually describe this phenomenon. So this is a kind of a large deviation analysis. And what you find for the binary perceptron is actually something, uh, let, let me use this, something like this. So here is the distance, and this is the number of solution. So this is the radius of, of, of this hypersphere, and, and here is the number of, uh, is the entropy. So these red dotted lines correspond to uh, the typical solution. So let's take, you take alpha equal 0.4, so you're within the region which you can store patterns, and then, you know, below a certain distance, you find that there are no solutions. And this is actually Kabashima work, okay? Uh, then, however, if you look at this local entropy, you find that indeed there exist these regions which, that contain a lot of solutions. So for instance, alpha equal 0.4, you have this blue curve, which essentially overlap with the log of the binomial coefficient, which, which means that you have regions that at, at sufficiently short distance are very, very flat. In the sense, everything is, solution, is a solution. So this calculation for us was uh, a relief because uh, we finally understood why algorithm work, because then you can numerically check that the algorithm actually end up in these very dense regions of solution. So the, the message is, in a non-convex device, you do have the typical solution, you have all the beautiful replica symmetry breaking schemes and so on and so forth, but there exist also dense regions that are rare, but you know, for the algorithms that actually work are the relevant ones, at least for the problems that we have looked at, okay? So we recently did some kind of rigorous calculation on, on a model that Lenka introduced of a binary 
perceptron, and also on the binary perceptron here, I mentioned only this result. And we can show that, in fact, in, in these models, you do have this isolated solution, but you also have, you know, for a, a pairs of, you also have an exponential number of solutions that are within a given distance. This is a rigorous bound ba based on second moment method. So you have rigorous results that show that, you know, actually there is something more than isolated solutions. Okay, don't, well, I can come back later. Now, that was the binary perceptron. What, does the same scenario hold for, for uh, continuous neural network? The answer is yes. Of course, you have to consider non-convex device because the perceptron just has a convex space. And so the, at, at least you have to consider one hidden layer, but you know, in, in deep network, you have plenty of them. So this is not uh, a real problem. And you have to replace the, the notion of high local entropy regions with wide flat minima. That's the same, the, the, the continuous counterpart of, of um, of that, and, uh, and what we find by, again, uh, doing this large deviation analysis is that on, on this kind of model, I, I go to the result, is that in addition to this scenario, in this kind of network, uh, there exist uh, uh, dense regions of solution which are overlooked by the replica analysis, okay? And um, I, I mean, this, this picture is horrible, besides being horrible, we have no real idea of, of the shape of this region. We know that this, uh, the solution can diffuse to, uh, up to long distances, but the, the, the geometry of this thing is not under control. We just know that there are regions of different uh, densities which are connected, but that's the kind of information we have, okay? Um, and so this, this is uh, the analytic outcome. And it's here, instead of distance, I have the overlap. So small distance are here. And here is the log of the volume you would have at that distance without any constraint given by the pattern, and the volume at that distance with the constraints. So by cutting away all those configurations that do not satisfy uh, the learning constraint. And so when this curve overlap with the horizontal line, it means that you are in a flat region, OK? Take it like that. And you see that for, for this machine, so with three, then you need the critical capacity is around uh, three, more or less. And so you, you observe that below, below the critical capacity, you do end up in regions that are very flat. And these are not the, 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 those, the dominant ones. These are kind of, um, and if you run algorithms, if you, for instance, do a quiet planting of, of, a, of a solution, then, uh, so in this plot, you have, again, here the distance, and here the volume around the solution computed using belief propagation. I, I skipped the, the, the analytic details, but, uh, and you see that the, uh, this curve corresponds to a planted solution, so somehow this would be a typical solution, the volume around a typical solution. This is the volume obtained by a certain type of by an algorithm which is called LAL, but it's one algorithm. And this is uh, the volume uh, obtained through an algorithm that explicitly tries to maximize the, 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 the flatness, okay? So are these device, devices special? Well, in a sense, yes, because in a sense, for instance, if you would replace the output node uh, to be a parity machine, Instead of uh, taking a sum, you would take a product of the output and, and decide based on that. Then you can show analytically that this, de this kind of uh, device does not display any wide flat minima in the rare e as a rare event. Of course, it doesn't also as a, as a typical event, but also as a rare event. So uh, now the question is, is this a of any relevance for learning? Uh, so can we design algorithm out of this? So the idea is, is that if you have a local entropy term, that, and then you can change the radius of the hypersphere inside which you, you try to, to maximize the number of, of solution, then uh, you can imagine to, to design uh, an algorithm doing that. And in fact, the trick is very simple. You can write the Boltzmann weight uh, which is, has this form where y is the conjugate parameter to, uh, to the um, local entropy, so what the free entropy say, so this is kind of a temp inverse temperature for the problem. And if you take y integer, then uh, this, the, 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 the partition function or the Boltzmann weight can, can be written like this. And so, uh, to make a long story short, uh, a way of constructing a measure or a cost function or a sampling technique that focuses on high density region is just to take many real copies of the original system and couple them together through a distance constraint. 
And this distance constraint is going to impose that you're sampling within a certain region, then you have many copies. Okay? And in the limit of infinitely many copies, you will find those uh, regions that are maximally dense. Uh, so this is a, a practical way of uh, accessing, uh, uh, entering those regions. And in fact, it's quite straightforward to write message passing algorithms like belief propagation, cavity techniques to, uh, to find uh, these kind of regions. And by the way, if I go back here, the, this blue line is obtained by belief propagation on this replicated graph. So you can actually find this efficiently these very dense regions. But you can also do replicated simulated annealing, which works beautifully. Uh, you can do replicated stochastic uh, descent and all this kind of stuff. And this has been used also in deep learning. Now, in deep learning, there are so many things that are done that it's very difficult to disentangle what is doing what. That's the, the, the point. But I guess that many of the techniques which are introduced, like, for instance, dropout or initialization, uh, renormaliza batch renormalization and so on, are just techniques that keep the system out of equilibrium and convert to these kind of regions. Uh, let me mention one thing, because this could be interesting for biological modeling. You can take a very simple algorithm, which is called the least action learning, which is just an algorithm that, whenever there is an error, tries to update the unit that has the, which is the cheapest to update, because it has a, a, an activation um, uh, with, that is very close to, to the threshold. So with the minimum change in the Ws, you can actually try to in, in, uh, increase, uh, uh, to <clears throat> enhance the output to, towards the right answer. So this is a very greedy algorithm that follows a path of least action. And this you know, kind of works, but doesn't generalize very well. But now, if you actually do the entropic version of this, so you take many copies of this and bound them to be to be uh, to a distant constraint, then this super simple algorithm is going to converge to, the, to this wide minima that you would no, normally try to access through some gradient, stochastic gradient with noise and blah, blah, blah. Okay? So this is an example. Maybe you can, one can find very elementary learning process that can exploit this kind of properties. Okay, so, well, this is the same as before. So let me just mention that one can also uh, check the, the flatness of the solution which are found by looking at the Eschen. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the error cost function doesn't have an action because it's a discrete function. And so, for instance, for the LAL algorithm, you don't really know how, which Eschen you should compute. But here the idea is that we find the solution, then we compute the Eschen using the mean square error cost function or the cross entropy cost function and, and normalize the way so that the spectrum is comparable for different algorithms. And so we, here we compare this greedy algorithm, um, stochastic gradient with, uh, okay, uh, two types of stochastic gradient, the entropic version of the greedy algorithm, and then the belief propagation algorithm, which uh, focuses on these wide uh, regions. And, and, uh, and you find that, in fact, FVP, so the, the, the algorithm which is designed to access this region has, has a spectrum that's more concentrated around zero, so it's flatter. Okay? And the other inter very interesting uh, message is that if you run a stochastic gradient with cross entropy and you do a small, a slow cooling of the, part of the temperature which is inside the cross entropy, which amounts in, uh, to keeping under control the norm of the weights, these two things are equivalent, then you can reach very flat regions. So normally people do not do perform an annealing on the cross entropy parameter, but in fact this is a very effective way of reaching wide flat minima. And you know, on some simple examples, we could also check that um, the, uh, this, uh, <coughs> this behavior correlates with the generalization performance. So the flatness correlates with the generalization performance on real data. Uh, so. There are many other applications of this. I mean, if, for instance, we, we have shown with, uh, with, uh, with the people before and also with Federica Gerace and Bert Kappen that um, if you use stochastic um, weights instead of determ deterministic weights, then if you keep the fluctuation of these stochastic weights not zero, so uh, 
far from, not very far, but say definitely non-zero, then automatically, if you now try to learn the probability distribution of, of these stochastic weights, then automatically they converge to these rare events in the W space. So stochasticity, not a thermal stochasticity, but a stochasticity in the, in the parameters helps in this direction. Another thing which is uh, uh, questionable is the fact that uh, um, quantum annealing also works for this kind of problem because quantum fluctuations take advantage of the existence of wide regions because the wave function can delocalize, and so the kinetic energy term in the quantum Hamiltonian encodes this information. So by minimizing the energy of the quantum Hamiltonian, you automatically go to these wide regions. And in the limit, you, in the classical limit, you are trapped there, and so you remain there. And you find, so it's very effective in, in finding solutions. This is not quantum supremacy, because we also have classical algorithms that work for these problems, but... Uh, uh, <clears throat> It works. We recently ran some experiments also for unsupervised learning. So we did a, a, an autoencoder. And uh, with this autoencoder, uh, auto uh, we, we compare the, just, just the plain autoencoder with this uh, entropic version. And you know, for the problem of, um, uh, for the kind of data that Mark was talking about, uh, I mean, uh, patterns which are obtained by a superposition of features coming from a certain dictionary, we can show that, in fact, these wide minima are uh, very effective in recovering the features uh, from, from the data. So just to say that also for unsupervised learning, what, this wide minima seems to be very effective, this is a numerical result, uh, seems to be very effective in extracting information about the structure of the data. And there are reasons for this, but I think I'm, I'm out of time. So. Uh, um, so just to conclude, let me uh, answer the question. So, wh um, so what, what about, say, the evolution of the neural network? So can we now understand what is happening in, in deep network in terms of optimization and in terms of all these features that have been uh, uh, introduced since the 90s? Well, the first result, which is very simple, is the following. If you take the binary perceptron or any non-convex device for which you can actually do the calculations, you can show that if you minimize the cross entropy, the ground state of the cross entropy loss function are surrounded by an exponential number of ground state of the error cost function. So when you minimize the cross entropy, you are moving away from the uh, typical solution of your learning plane learning problem, and you end up in ground states that corresponds to rare regions of the original error cost function. So to me, this is the answer why people are using cross entropy. It's not any particular, it's just an optimization problem. Uh, you are ending up in accessible wide minima. And it's, it's kind of obvious because uh, I mean, cross entropy introduces a robustness and so on and so forth, but, but this is something one can compute using a Franz Parisi, Franz Parisi method. And then going back to the ReLU cost function, um, the, we have this result about the capacity that I mentioned to you before, uh, this result here. But then you can ask, well, are these, is this all? No, it's not all, because what happens if, is that if you use the ReLU cost function compared to the sine or, or hyperbolic tangent that are steep enough, what happens is that for low alpha, so below the critical capacity, the, the, the ground states that you find by optimizing a network that uses this ReLU cost function are actually more dense in solution. They, be, they, they belong to lakes that are bigger, and in fact, they, so this, the, the diff, this is the difference between this would be the, okay, let's look at these two curves. Here is distance zero. Okay, just look. The fact that this red line is above this blue line means that the ReLU function is uh, more entropic compared to the uh, sine function. And what is you know, kind of interesting is that if you, now, the, the, uh, if you now perform a perturbation of the inputs, just you know, take the training set, you perturb some of the inputs, and you look how many times the output is uh, changed. What you find is that uh, with the ReLU function, the rate of 
error is strongly reduced. So they're much more robust to input perturbation. So you, know, you have these things that always go together. Uh, a dynamical aspect, so it's, they're easy to optimize and at the same time are more robust for, for uh, say, generalization purposes. And, and this, was, this is a numerical experiment, but this can be done analytically, just that we didn't want to do it. We, we were just tired, but, but it's very easy to do analytically. Um, so the final message for me is the following, is that we start in the 90s, we had a landscape looking like this. And then by changing loss function, transfer function, learning dynamics, and architecture, we somehow end up with a, you know, with a landscape that looks like this. And this is more or less what's happening you know, in, at the, in the building blocks of, uh, of these deep networks. And we are now studying uh, the effect of having multiple layers on the, lo the, lo on the flatness of the minima that you find. And so we have some results about that, but I'm not going to talk uh, today because they are too preliminary. And uh, so, <clears throat> so these are the, the uh, these green things are something that we more or less understood. And then, you know, the, the red thing is something we want to uh, understand in the near future. But of course, there are, you know, many other problems that we would like to address that are of much more general nature. So somehow for me, I mean, deep networks are not the end of the story. They are just, you know, devices that work a bit better than what they used to work in the 90s. And now given the computational power and all that, we, we can do a lot of things with that. But there are, from, there are fantastic problems that we should address. One that I find particularly fascinating is the, the idea of, uh, of trying to detect invariances across data sets as a way of extracting causality. And this is a very complicated problem, but it can be addressed in algorithmic terms. And uh, also, the idea of merging the search of architecture together with the optimization of the weights is very interesting. And this leads, as far as I've known from, know from experimental results, to highly glassy landscapes and highly non-convex problems. So it's, again, I think it's a good thing for us to, to look at. Uh, I think I, I stop here. <clears throat>